Sorry, it was too rough. Okay, so at the very end of class on Monday, which somehow feels like ages ago, um, we had just started talking about our chondrichthys, right? So now we're going to be looking at what are some of these specific traits that make chondrichthys who they are. And so the key here is first off we're going to look at right these generic upgrades right so remember that was one of the first things we knew we were going to talk about so remember upgrades are things that everybody has we call these synapomorphies <clears throat> and then we're going to look at unique characteristics okay and so unique characteristics are things that only chondric these have Okay, so we're going to compare these two things and talk about how this is important as we proceed looking at these classes going forward. So we're going to talk about our upgrades first, right? Remember our synapomorphies, which are things that not only chondrichthys has, okay, but everybody moving forward has. Right, so we looked at these before, right, when we talked about well, what did vertebrates have as upgrades over chordates. Remember, these were not things that only vertebrates have, right, but everybody that came after vertebrates. So let's take a peek at these first. <clears throat> so in case it's been a while, right, here's that term that was really important, synapomorphies. We haven't seen it in a long time. You going to draw for me? Okay. Just remember we can break this word down. Right, so remember if we take the suffix here, okay, that we have that morphies, right, so morph, being a trait, okay, and our prefix here, remember we have synapo meaning like same. Okay, so these upgrades we're talking about are something that's going to stay the same. Okay, or something that's held true for everybody here on out, right? So this is something that sharks will have, fishes would have, birds will have, okay, all the way up. So it's like an embedded trait. Mm. All right, so you see here in my box then, one thing that's going to be really important as we kind of trounce through or get a tour through our classes is keeping track of the difference between which things are upgrades or synapomorphies Okay, so which things are going to carry through and which things are going to be unique. Or only for this class. Right, or looking at well, which set of traits set this class apart. Okay, so what makes in this case, right, a shark a shark. <clears throat> And both these things are going to be important in understanding vertebrates in general, right, and vertebrate relationships. Mm. Okay, so these two terms, as well as our overall goal, make good sense. Mm. 
Okay, so let's start, right, we're talking about advances or upgrades, right, these are all, practice our terms here, synapomorphies. Okay, so we'll start with the most intuitive, right, things we can picture carry through to all the organisms that come after this, right? Sharks have this, fishes have this, we have this, okay? Our agnathans, the things that came before this, did not have this, right? Remember, our agnathans are things like lamprey and hagfish. Do I happen to grab your question, Cody? Yeah. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is jaws. Okay, the advent of the jaws. So we remember our lamprey and hagfish. They're okay, the very definition of these types of fishes. Right, is that they were agnatha. Okay, so remember that a prefix means without. Okay, so these were jawless. Remember all these guys have that weird, terrifying sort of circular mouths where they sort of latched on and sucked or tore pieces of their prey. <clears throat> but everybody that came after that <clears throat> has some sort of reinforced hinged jaw system. <coughs> Excuse me. Hinged jaw system. All right, so the key as we think about having hinge jaws, okay, is we can have a much bigger gape, right, and a much more flexible gape. So the types of food that we can eat now can be much larger. Okay, so this goes with the theme that we were talking about when we talked about our vertebrate upgrades. Remember, a lot of our vertebrate upgrades all lent us towards a lot of the same theme. Right, we got more control over what we were doing, and it allowed organisms to um, hunt and consume larger prey items. Okay, so they can have a larger and more active lifestyle. Here we see that same thing happening, right? If I have jaws, so I can open my mouth wider, I can now consume larger prey, I can attack larger prey. Larger prey are going to have more nutrients for my body, and that's going to give me more energy. So again, my repercussions here are, right, I can then be more active, and I have more energy to be more active, to be hunting larger things. So as my diversity in food choices go up, right, so does my energy and nutrients. Gracious nutrient levels. Okay. No more chunks of whale carcass for me. Hi. Whoops. That looks weird, doesn't it? The next thing that we see, right, so these are things that we've seen a lot of in lab, right, so this is good reinforcement, is the increase in the types of fins, and specifically, we got paired fins. All right, so here I've got both um, skeleton types up here, All right, so this would be much more like our lamprey compared with our shark. All right, so things like our lamprey had fins, it wasn't finless, right? But the key here is we were pretty much reduced or limited to the two fins along the top or having one long fin across the top, depending on what it was. What's the fin across the top called? Nice and loud. The dorsal, good. I'm studying in while we're here. Okay, and the fin across or down 
Swishing in the back. What's that fin called? Caudal. Good. With confidence, too. So that's pretty much all we have. Now those are good fins, important fins, right? We're not knocking the fins that our lamprey had, but we know the caudal fin, right? All fishes have this, this is important, right? Caudal fins give us thrust, okay? If I have a sail across the top, right? This is gonna keep me from tipping. This is good for control. We'll talk about fins a little bit more as we move forward. Okay. My chondrichthy still has both of those, right? Here's my caudal fin. Okay. Here's my dorsal fin. Okay, so check, check. We're not losing any fins. Hey, but the key here is that we've gained some fins. Okay, in particular, my paired fins that are up by my chest, what are those fins called? Pectoral. Good. And the paired fins that are more or less by my hips. What are those fins called? What's another word for hips? Elvis, good. It's definitely a P. Okay, oops. Okay, so now we have a whole additional set of fins okay, that are paired, just like our limbs are paired, okay, which, as you might imagine, is important. Okay. But this is important for multiple reasons. So not only do we now have paired limbs, okay, which is key as far as organisms go moving forward, but they function like paired limbs function, which we'll see in the lab after your first lab exam, which is now like a thousand years from now. But, <clears> hi. <throat> right. So they work in cahoots together. Hi. Right. So for something like a shark where they're quite stiff, you guys all kind of remember handling the very stiff um, fins that we had for their sharks. They act much like airplane wings. Right, allowing them to navigate the ocean. But on much smaller fish, right, that can sit or move around on, say, like a reef, right, or we saw the mud skipper in our life of water, right, they can use them to shimmy around a little bit. So they can literally move them in cahoots with each other to move around in their environment, even if that is above or underwater. Mm, nifty, very useful. <clears throat> okay, so again though, overarching theme, if I have more control of myself both in the water column, right, or right on the sand, control is still my story, okay? By having these paired fins, I still have increased control over mobility is what these upgrades are still giving us, right? That's a big key feature. Yeah, I didn't actually want to do that. Let's do this instead. Okay. <clears throat> the other key that we're seeing is this skeletal support. So we had our notochord and we had our vertebra, right? These were from being a vertebrate. But we've noticed from our chondrichthys, and this was a continuing theme as you guys got into your osteichthys, so we're going to see this continue, right? That the skeletons of these fishes got quite dramatic, and as far as our dissections go, it got to be kind of a pain, right? So we have our notochord here, right? 
And we certainly had our notochord surrounded in our vertebra. Those were all our upgrades from uh, being a vertebrate. Okay. But as we look at our sharky shark, there's a lot more than just having a vertebra here. <clears throat> okay, so all of our fins, for example, right, this is just a skeleton. That's all I have on here. So the fins themselves, right, and this is why they were so stiff, okay, just like our limbs. Okay, so we're using the word fins. We could generically use the word limb. Okay, have skeletal structure in them, which is good, right? That's what's causing them to be as useful as they are, so they can resist water pressure, or they can be useful if they want to move around on the bottom of the wherever they live. Okay, we also see the face. Or that cranial area. Okay, we already know they have jaws, and that jaw should have some kind of skeletal support. It's not going to be very good for the crunchy, crunchy time. Okay, but it is certainly even further than the jaw. And we see several facial structures, <coughs> in particular, helping to support and protect those sensory organs. Okay, that were upgrades from our vertebrates. Okay. So here we see reinforcing all of these features that we already knew were important. And we're not knocking little buddy here, but there was definitely room for improvement. Still feel good? Going in an okay clip? The next thing we're going to do is, if our argument is, well, now we have jaws, so we can eat bigger things, we're going to support those jaws with some additional skeleton pieces. Remember, in this case, our skeleton is made out of cartilage, right, so we want to be careful. Okay, if we're going to be eating bigger and better things, okay, we need to have some sort of mouth support that's going to actually allow us to tackle that. So the picture on the left here is from our lamprey, right, that nice nightmare fuel. So it should look a little familiar, okay. So we've zoomed in here. So right in the center here, right, that was our lamprey's tongue. Right, which would lash out and tear flesh. Hooray! Okay, and then the teeth here along the outside, okay, which look a little bit like pegs or hooks, okay, are what allows the lamprey to latch on. Right, so there's that circular jawless space. Okay. Very effective. Obviously, they're still alive and kicking. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. But these little teeth here. They're not made out of the same stuff our teeth are made of. Right, these are made out of keratin. Which is very similar to the kind of stuff that your fingernails are made out of. Okay, so it's still pretty hard, particularly if you imagine them being sort of reinforced three-dimensional pieces, more like a cat's claw right, than our own fingernails. So I still wouldn't want one embedded in my flesh. Okay? But probably not tough enough to tear another fish in half, right? Just enough to probably tear a little bit of skin off. So what we see as we move forward is teeth made of what are called dentine. Now, dentine is what our teeth are made out of, or at least what the core of our teeth are made out of. It's quite a hard material. It doesn't have the dual layer system that ours has, but it's definitely an improvement. Right? And as we'll find here, shark's teeth are replaceable, so if they do bust or get torn out, it's not the end of the world either, which is also different. Mm.
Right, so we're getting bigger teeth and harder teeth. Right, so this is helping to tackle the bigger and larger prey that the much larger mouths are then designed to tackle. And as we know, pretty much all mouths moving forward have right, these larger dentine cord teeth. Okay, with top, oops, please excuse the arrow I thought I erased. Okay, we've talked about this one as well. We talked about life in the water, okay, but the advent of the semicircular canals. Okay, we have these, okay, and sharks started the advent of having three, okay, so these three uh, work in perpendicular directions to each other, like meaning they run opposite. So you have one running this way, one running this way, and one running this way. Okay, so remember these are fluid filled. Oh my gosh, change the colors and as always. I'm just going to fill kind of one of these. Remember, you want to imagine these being partially fluid filled, right? So the fluid's always sunk to the bottom. And this is giving you a nervous, a nerve based response, right? So as you tip forward, okay, that fluid's going to move with you. And depending on how that fluid is settled into all three of these rings, right, even if your eyes are closed, right, this is going to give you an idea of how your body is oriented in three-dimensional space. All right, so now we know we don't have things like otoliths and stuff, right? But we do all have okay, these semicircular canal systems, right? Because we can all close our eyes, right? Twist and bend around and have somewhat of an idea of not necessarily where we are, Right, but how we're shaped. Am I laying down? Am I sitting up? Right, how is my head position compared to whatever space that I'm in? Right, and that's thanks to this semicircular canal system that for us is in our inner ear, but it's located in approximately the same space in fishes, right? Since we cut pretty close to this and we got it out of our um, ostia, please, the other. See, that feels like forever ago now, too. Okay, still feel good? Any questions? Would you just stop being rude? About the synapomorphies or the upgrades that our chondrichthys have. Okay, so remember all of these, okay, in some form, are going to carry through to the organisms that we'll continue talking about. So we'll see them again. And our osteophytes, we'll see them again when we talk about amphibians, right? <clears throat> so, nope. The next thing we want to talk about then is these are our chondrichthys, right? So they're going to have all the things we just talked about, um, but so does everybody else we're going to talk about. So, what are some things then, what are the unique characteristics, okay, that sets our class chondrichthys aside? Okay, so what makes a chondrichthys or a cartilaginous fish a cartilaginous fish? So we're just trying to sound fake up here, right? So what makes them special or unique or separate, right? Why would we not just pull them in with, start with our osteichthys? Okay, so just as a reminder, and we'll get here, right, our chondrichthys are made up of two subclasses, okay? It's very easy to forget about the other subclass because it's super weird. So the one subclass, remember, is the elasmobranchii. It has to do with the way their gills are. 
So Lazmo is breathing. <clears throat> this is basically our shark skates and rays. So everything that you think about probably as a conjure key is all in the one subclass. The other subclass, remember, is the weird subclass. Okay, literally holocephali, right, or strange head, or strange face. All right, it's a very small subclass, relatively speaking. Remember, class chondrix these is small anyway. It's the smallest of all the classes. So within the small, it's even smaller. Okay, but so worthy of talking about, partly because they're super cool, and they are distinctly, as you can tell, different from the other subclass. So what exactly is it then that's tying whew, all of these guys together but keeps them separate from everybody else? <clears throat> hey, well, as the name implies, so not surprisingly, right, we have a cartilaginous skeleton. Okay, so this is what they actually look like under x-ray, which is super cool. Okay. So remember, we lack a calcium phosphate backbone. Okay. So this is something we really need to continuously remind ourselves that you can be vertebrate, right? But you do not need to be bony. Okay. And the cartilaginous fishes are a really good example of that. Right? Sharks are tough. Okay been around for millions of years. Okay. We've all gotten to cut into one now. So there's certainly no doubting that they have a vertebra, right? They have a very strong backbone, but their entire body is made of this cartilage. Okay. So they do have a full skeleton. We saw from the previous one, they have a really good reinforced skeleton. Right, running throughout their body, both along their back, right, their face and their fins. And we can see even with some of our skates and rays, those are the ones that look like they have wings, right, that we get quite extensive skeletal support in these enlarged fins. Okay, but it's all cartilaginous. So there's some benefits to this, right? Cartilage is much cheaper energetically to make than bone is. Right? Remember, everything is an energetic balance in the body, okay? So I don't have to invest as much energetically to build cartilage as I do to build bone. Right? So much, much cheaper, okay? And I have a little bit of flexibility and this works out okay, right? Because they're living in the water, right? So they still have the ability to be flexible, right? They don't have as much gravity. They've got some buoyancy. So they've kind of got a good balance going here. Okay, when we do our transition to land, you'll see why none of us can pull this off. All right, the next thing, okay, big word, but something you're already familiar with. So serratotracheal fin rays. Okay, so as we think about our fishes, you guys have handled both types of fishes at this point. Okay, remember when we handled our sharks, okay, the reality being that your shark fins were quite stiff, right? And so we've talked about this a couple of times now. Relative, oops, sorry about that. Relative to the bony outcroppings that existed in your perches, I guess that was last week at least for everybody, but they could be sort of flipped and bent. Right? They're kind of like little hands. 
to shake the little perchy hands. Okay, but when we were dealing with our sharks, okay, these fins were quite, whoosh, they were just hands out, right? Okay, you kind of had to take the whole hand and move it. Okay, and sometimes they got in the way, it was just sort of like, can we just cut it off? Right, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. Like the whole kind of arm had to come and move and became that whole armoire door. Okay. <clears throat> so I have akin to this here on our sharks, the serrato tracheal, as well as those airplane wings. Okay. With our sharks or any of our chondrichthys, right, these serrato tracheal are so stiff, right, because they are not segmented well. And they are reinforced with keratin, right? That thing that's in your fingernails that makes them so tough. Okay, is what gives them these stiffness. But they work for the same reason that airplane wings work, right? Remember, sharks do not have swim bladders. Okay, remember that from opening them up. Okay. So they need as many different things in their bodies they can to give them lift. What are the things that give our chondrichthys lift? The liver, right? They have a fatty and oily liver. Good. What else? What kind of tail do our sharks have? What's it look like? Good. It is hetero something. Ooh. So it's a heterocircle tail, so it has that top lobe that's bigger. Okay, and we have basically airplane wings for arms, right? So once we are in that water column, it's going to kind of allow us to glide around. Say again for me. Yeah. Yes, it helps with buoyancy. <laughs> and we're not going to talk about the osteopies fins till we get there. But we'll find comparatively they are no such help. But of course, our osteopathies need no such help, right? So they can commit their fins to a different kind of cause. Okay, so we've gotten to talk about this a little, right, mentioned it in passing, and then we talked about this in lab this week, so depending on if you really committed yourself to lab this week would be helpful if this you were on this. But sharks and chondrichthys um, have very specific type of scales, right? So we've been talking about scales this week in lab, hence why if you were in lab this week, you spent more time on this than others. Um, so the scales, if we remember when we handled our sharks, were very particular, right? So if you remember kind of petting your shark, um, it had that very rough texture. It was certainly more than happy to tear your gloves. Um, but unlike when we handled the perch then last week, right, they did not come off in sheets. They didn't flick around or stick to things, better or worse, depending on... Um, how frustrating they were to deal with, but it still did its job, right? It was difficult to cut through, it dulled your blade, okay? So the stuff is very tough, okay? And that's because the stuff it's made out of, okay, is the same stuff its teeth are made out of. 
So our placoid scales, as we see when we look at this, still have that core of dentine. Okay. They even have a little bit of a topper that's very similar to the kind of enamel that we have on our teeth. So this is some hard scaling. Okay. And as we look at the electron microscopy photo up here, which is basically super zoomed in on what scales on a shark look like, it's just sort of overlapping type of shingles. Okay. Very, very tough. So they're basically just little teeth all overlapped on top of each other. Okay, very, very tough. Okay, and they grow straight out of the skin, right? Unlike the fishes do, right? Which seem to lay right on top of the skin like a protective barrier. So this is one of those good, bad things, right? Remember, fish scales can be pulled off and replaced, which is not what we would see for our shark scales, which is not surprising. Okay, if it's growing out of the skin, it's part of the skin. So this is going to be much thicker and tougher. Okay, but, of course, the negative is if it's torn up, it's gone, right? Which is why on sharks, right, sharks that have been bitten up or torn up, you can see scarring on them, right? We've all seen Discovery Channel documentaries where sharks have those big scars on their body. Okay, so this sutures back up more like regular skin does like on you and I. Okay, so sharks have their own unique version of scales. Okay. And highly related to their teeth. Okay, now we already talked about sharks having a good upgraded version of teeth, but I mentioned that their teeth can be replaced. Okay, this is important because sharks are pretty rough and tumble animals. So if they had teeth like we did, right, if we lose a tooth, we're kind of, well, screwed, right? If, well, dentists can help us out. But naturally speaking, if I lose one of my adult teeth, I'm just out a tooth, right? And I'm just gumming it the rest of my life. If for something like a shark, okay, if I lost my teeth, I would starve to death, right? Sharks are completely carnivorous, so they need their teeth to live, right? And I'm battling, right, and chewing large prey, so the likelihood is I'm going to lose teeth, right? They're not bringing their hands around to grip their prey and hold it quietly, okay? So the only thing they're going to use to grab their prey is their teeth, and their prey are alive when they grab them with their mouths. So they're fighting. And squirming when they're in their mouths. All right, so teeth loss is super common. So teeth replacement has to happen. All right, so here's a picture of their mouth. The key here with tooth replacement, right? is it works a bit like a chainsaw, a very slow moving chainsaw, okay? So the teeth that are on the outer edge here are the ones that we're biting with, right? These are older, more mature teeth, they're longer, okay? They're also more likely to get pulled out, okay? On the inside of the mouth, coming out of the gums, are constantly growing new baby teeth. Okay, as the baby teeth grow, we can see from the arrows that they're constantly getting pushed both up and forward, right, towards what you would kind of imagine being your chin, right? So instead of just having one place in the jaw, you're going to imagine the whole front of your jaw being a set of gums, and they're kind of moving up and forward. So coming out of, like, the front of your jaw is going to be the newest tooth. This is what I'm going to bite and fight with. Okay, and coming out like where your teeth or your tongue are right now in real life would be baby teeth, right? So if I get into a fight, right, something takes my tooth, that's okay, right? Because in 28 to 48 hours, new teeth are going to just whirl right in. An endless angry supply. Right. A 
I get excited about sharks. I'm going to shut up. Oh, shut up just in time. Kind of pushing it, though. So sorry about that. Shark teeth are cool. Oh, I'm not hot today. Want to 